A quick new idea, daily, from the world's greatest TEDx talks. I'm your host, Atosa Leone, and this is TEDx Shorts. Traffic during a commute. Receiving unexpected bills. These are some everyday grievances that could leave us feeling upset, even angry. Ryan Martin is a psychologist and anger researcher who says it's actually okay to be angry sometimes. In today's talk, he looks at the cognitive process behind this emotion, why it's natural, and when it may be a problem. All right, so I want you to imagine that you get a text from a friend and it reads, you will not believe what just happened. I'm so mad right now. So you do the dutiful thing as a friend and you ask for details and they tell you a story about what happened to them at the gym or at work or on their date last night. And you listen and you try to understand why they're so mad. Maybe even secretly judge whether or not they should be so mad. (laughs) And maybe you even offer some suggestions. Now, in that moment, you are doing essentially what I get to do every day because I'm an anger researcher. And as an anger researcher, I spend a good part of my professional life studying why people get mad. I study the types of thoughts they have when they get mad, and I even study what they do when they get mad, whether it's getting into fights or breaking things or even yelling at people in all caps on the internet. Anger is universal. It's something we all feel. We've been feeling it since the first few months of life when we didn't get what we wanted and our cries of of protests, things like, what do you mean you won't pick up the rattle, Dad? I want it. (laughs) We feel it throughout our teenage years. We feel it to the very end. In fact, anger has been with us at some of the worst moments of our lives. It's a natural and expected part of our grief, but it's also been with us at some of the best moments of our lives, with those special occasions like weddings and vacations, often marred by these everyday frustrations, bad weather, travel delays that feel horrible in the moment, but then are ultimately forgotten when things go okay. And I bet many people in this room right now, you see anger as a problem. You see the way it interferes in your life, the way it damages relationships, maybe even the ways it's scary. Today, I want to tell you something really important about your anger, and it's this. Anger is a powerful and healthy force in your life. It's good that you feel it. You need to feel it. But to understand all that, we actually have to back up and talk about why we get mad in the first place. And a lot of this comes back to the work of an anger researcher named Dr. Jerry Deffenbacher, who wrote about this back in 1996 uh, in a book chapter on how to deal with problematic anger. Now, for most of us, and I bet most of you, it feels as simple as this. I get mad when I'm provoked, right? You hear it in the language people use. They say things like, it makes me so mad when people drive this slow, or I got mad because... Uh, she left the milk out again. Or my favorite, I don't have an anger problem. People just need to stop messing with me. (laughs) Now, in the spirit of better understanding those types of provocations, I ask a lot of people, including my friends and colleagues and even family, what are the things that really get to you? What makes you mad? Sometimes their answers aren't minor at all. Sometimes they talk about racism and sexism and bullying and environmental destruction, big global problems we all face. But sometimes their answers are very specific, maybe even oddly specific. That wet line you get across your shirt when you accidentally lean against the counter of a public bathroom. Or flash drives. There's only two ways to plug them in, so why does it always take me three tries? (laughs) Now, whether it's minor or major, whether it's general or specific, we get angry in situations that could have been avoided and that leave us feeling powerless. This is a recipe for anger. But you can also tell that anger is probably not the only thing we're feeling in these situations, right? Anger doesn't happen in a vacuum. We can feel angry at the same time that we're scared or sad or feeling a host of other emotions. But here's the thing. These provocations, they aren't making us mad at least not on their own. And we know that because if they were, we'd all get angry over the same things, and we don't. The reasons I get angry are different than the reasons you get angry, so there's gotta be something else going on. What is that something else? Well, we know what we're doing and feeling at the moment of that provocation matters. We call this the pre-anger state. Are you hungry? Are you tired? Are you anxious about something else? Are you running late for something? When you're feeling those things, 
those provocations feel that much worse. But what matters most, it's not the provocation, it's not the pre-anger state, it's this. It's how we interpret that provocation. It's how we make sense of it in our lives. When something happens to us, we first decide, is this good or bad? Is it fair or unfair? Is it blameworthy? Is it punishable? This primary appraisal is when you evaluate the event itself, and we decide what it means in the context of our lives. And then once we've done that, we decide how bad it is. That's secondary appraisal, right? We say, is this the worst thing that's ever happened? Or can I cope with this? Angry people tend to put blame where it doesn't belong, not just on people, but actually inanimate objects as well. And if you think that sounds ridiculous, think about the last time you lost your car keys and you said, where did those car keys go? Right? Because you know they ran off on their own. They tend to overgeneralize. They use words like always, never, every, this always happens to me, I never get what I want, or I hit every stoplight on the way here today. Demanding this, they put their own needs ahead of the needs of others. I don't care why this person is driving so slow, they need to speed up or move over so I can get to this job interview. And finally, inflammatory labeling. <laughs> they call people fools, idiots, monsters. So for a long time, psychologists have referred to these as cognitive distortions or even irrational beliefs. And yeah, sometimes they are irrational, um, maybe even most of the time. But sometimes these thoughts are totally rational. There is unfairness in the world. There are cruel, selfish people, and it's not only okay to be angry when we're treated poorly, it's right to be angry when we're treated poorly. Now, if there's one thing I want you to remember from my talk today, it's this. Your anger exists in you as an emotion because it offered your ancestors, both human and non-human, with an evolutionary advantage. It's one, just as your fear alerts you to danger, your anger alerts you to injustice. It's one of the ways your brain communicates to you that you have had enough. What's more, it energizes you to confront that injustice. Think for a second about the last time you got mad. Your heart rate increased. Your breathing increased. You started to sweat. That's your sympathetic nervous system, otherwise known as your fight or flight system, kicking you in, excuse me, kicking in to offer you the energy you need to respond. And that's just the stuff you noticed. At the same time, your digestive system, it slowed down so you could conserve energy. That's why your mouth went dry. And your blood vessels dilated to get, muscle, uh, to get blood to your extremities. That's why your face went red. It's all part of this complex pattern of physiological experiences that exist today because they helped your ancestors uh, deal with cruel and unforgiving forces of nature. And the problem is, that the thing your ancestors did to deal with their anger, to physically fight, they're no longer reasonable or appropriate. You can't and you shouldn't swing a club every time you're provoked. <laughs> but here's the good news. You are capable of something your non-human ancestors weren't capable of, and that is the capacity to regulate your emotions. Even when you want to lash out, you can stop yourself and you can channel that anger into something more productive. I like to think of anger as a motivator, the same way your thirst motivates you to get a drink of water, the same way your hunger motivates you to get a bite to eat, your anger can motivate you to respond to injustice. Because we don't have to think too hard to find things we should be mad about. When we go back to the beginning, yeah, some of those things, they're silly and not worth getting angry over. But racism, sexism, bullying, environmental destruction, those things are real, those things are terrible. And the only way to fix them is to get mad first and then channel that anger into fighting back. And you don't have to fight back with aggression or hostility or violence. There are infinite ways that you can express your anger. You can protest. You can write letters to the editor. You can donate to and volunteer for causes. You can create art. You can create literature. You can create poetry and music. You can create a community that cares for one another and does not allow those atrocities to happen. So the next time you feel yourself getting angry, instead of trying to turn it off, I hope you'll listen to what that anger is telling you. And then I hope you'll channel it into something positive and productive. The TEDx talk you just listened to was recorded at a TEDx event in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. All TEDx events are independently organized by volunteers who believe in TED's mission of ideas worth spreading. Special thanks to the organizing team at TEDx Fond du Lac. 
Visit TED.com slash TEDx Shorts to listen to the full talk and learn more about TEDx Shorts. I'm Matosa Leone. Thanks for listening and see you tomorrow.